Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the reflection, uh, a discussion in English uh, in which uh, we allow uh, people to share their success story, opinion, as well as their field of expertise. So today I got to uh, I got information to inform you that uh, this is our great privilege uh, to be joined by honorable guest speaker, uh, a former ASEAN uh, Deputy Secretary General for Social Cultural Community, His Excellency Kung Po. His Excellency Kung Po uh, actually uh, will end his tenure uh, as a Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN uh, for a Social Cultural Community uh, this evening. So, but he is now back to the kingdom. His Excellency, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Nisai. Thank you. His Excellency, uh, I think uh, I, I, this, this discussion uh, will be uh, conducted uh, in English and also uh, we would like uh, uh, to know more about your achievements uh, throughout your mandate, as well as your assessments of the ongoing community building process, especially mm -hmm. your view from the within. And uh, we also very much uh, love to hear to hear your opinions uh, in this subject matter. Uh, and uh, before I begin uh, uh, asking you question, uh, let me uh, give uh, our audiences a brief of introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, His Excellency Kung Po uh, was appointed as a Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN uh, in charge of ASEAN's uh, social cultural community, or we know that ASCC from 2000. 18 to 2021, so uh, this year. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, he, uh, his mandate will be uh, effectively uh, end uh, uh, this evening. So uh, maybe at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, because he also need to have a at the uh, meeting before that a bit a bit uh, tight schedule for him. But he still uh, managed to join us uh, during his meant that uh, as a uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, His Excellency Kong Po uh, uh, involved uh, uh, on uh, uh, overseeing uh, the implementation of uh, various projects under the ASCC, uh, uh, focusing on establishing a common identity and forming a caring and sharing community. So his works uh, really cover a wide range of issue in the region. And uh, it are actually related to the, the life, the well-being of the people, the connectivity between our uh, people uh, uh, throughout the region. So this is very important work. That's why I think uh, he's now here with us to share his, story, uh, his own story, as well as uh, his achievement in, in doing this job. Again, uh, His Excellency, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, my first questions uh, to you um, as a, 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 a Deputy Secretary General, uh, would you mind sharing with us uh, your achievements uh, you have made as the Deputy Secretary General of uh, uh, the, the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN uh, for uh, ASEAN Social Cultural Community. So any achievement that you would like to highlight is really uh, grateful uh, this time. Thank you. The floor is your piece uh, 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 Well, thank you very much, uh, Isai, you know, for the kind introduction. And I would like to also thank you, you know, for taking the opportunity to have such a conversations with me. Uh, for me to share stories and also some experiences and hopefully those stories and experiences can be useful uh, for our young people uh, not just about learning about ASEAN but how they are going to prepare uh, themselves you know to uh, be a part of all the activities uh, of the uh, ASEAN uh, community building process. Perhaps let me start by saying a bit about the uh, social cultural communities. You rightly pointed out that it's a very important pillar and I can also tell you that it's the biggest pillar. It covers 15 sector bodies, ranging from health, education, labor, civil service, environment, disaster management, gender, you know, so many uh, aspects of uh, works are closely related uh, with the health and well being of our people. That's why sometimes you won't be surprised if you hear people calling this uh, pillar the uh, people's pillar. The reason is very simple because it is the pillar that is working, you know, for the uh, general benefits of our people. 
saying this, it doesn't mean that our pillars are not working, you know, for the benefits of the people. But this pillar, the work, you know, the achievement and so on, some things that people can feel directly, some things people can see, you know. Uh, for example, we put in place an education uh, policy or framework, and then our students will feel, you know, the effects of this uh, policies and document and so on. That's why uh, it is also called the uh, People's Pillar. So I just want to have this, you know, brief uh, introduction about the ASCC uh, Pillar. Now it comes to the uh, achievement that I uh, managed, you know, to 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 make over the past three years as the Deputy Secretary General for the uh, ASCC. Uh, perhaps I should put it into seven uh, different uh, categories. Uh, the first one is about the uh, ability to mobilize resources. Uh, soon we have 15 sector bodies. It also means there's so, ma so many activities, so many programs, and most of those uh, programs and activity, we need a lot of money to implement. Uh, different from other pillars, they're working pretty much on, you know, producing document framework and all that. Uh, ASCC also have a lot of, you know, on the ground kind of activities. Yeah. So we need a lot of money to do that. So over the past three years, you know, since, since I started my job as a DSG for the ASCC, I managed to mobilize around 200 million US dollars to support all the activities under the ASCC. And it's not easy because our partners are also having a lot of priorities as well. So the ability, you know, to really get the support, to, to, to get the belief in the kind of things that you do uh, it takes uh, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, engagement and uh, engagement here. It's not just about, you know, uh, working relationship, but also personal relationship as well. Uh, but everything starts with good idea, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, I would, you know, want to share this to our young people as well. Uh, of course, uh, the first things you would want to look at is where you can get the money, for example. Mm. Uh, but perhaps that's not the most productive way of addressing the problem. I think you should start with the passion. You should start with the belief. You should start with the ideas that you think that it's going to be extremely important and useful, not just for you as the initiator of the idea, but also those you intend to uh, make sure that these ideas will bring benefits to them. With all of these key elements, then I think it's a lot easier for you to uh, get the buy-in from uh, our partners. Yeah. And if you argue with compassion, when you argue with a strong belief in some things that you are asking people to support, then it's a lot easier for them to support as well. Yeah. I yeah. think if you go to them and then asking them to support some things, even you yourself yeah. are not so sure that you know whether <laughs> all of this are going to be very useful. Yeah. And that's going to be a very wrong premise in terms of, you know, reaching out to partners and getting support and so on. So this is the first one. Uh, secondly, um, it's about, you know, putting in place a numbers of long-term uh, uh, initiative plan or roadmap uh, to address some of the biggest problems that we face, uh, you know, uh, ASEAN. Uh, it's not just about, you know, building the community, but also, at the same time, trying to help the uh, member state to tackle some of very, very tough uh, question. Uh, for example, now we are in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, it's very important how we are going to work to address all of those problems. Uh, climate change is also another major uh, issues there. Uh, we are going to have more discussions on this uh, later on as you outline in your uh, yeah. you know, introductions that we are going to discuss about some challenges. So I will touch on these matters in more details at uh, the latest stage, but what I can say is now a numbers of key uh, institution, uh, initiative policy framework and so on that I, man I manage, you know, to put in place are going to have, uh, you know, long-term implications on how ASEAN and ASEAN member states are going to address all of those problems. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, my proposal to establish the uh, ASEAN public health emergency and emerging disease uh, uh, and we managed to uh, get around, you know, 70 million US dollar support from our partner for this center. And the role of this center is going to help the ASEAN member state in responding to COVID-19 and so on. Uh, but I'm going to touch more on this uh, later on when we are talking about challenges. Uh, I also, you know, uh, involve in streamlining the work plan. We have very long work plan. We have 
a lot of activities under each work plan. But I don't think that's the most effective way in doing things. You know, uh, it's not just about the numbers of activities, but we should also focus on the qualities, the impacts uh, of those activities as well. So if you look at the new uh, work plan, there are fewer activities, but more impactful multi-year project instead of one-off activity, for example, doing a seminar or something like that. So, you know, uh, all of this uh, uh, efforts are for the strengthening of the uh, work of the sectoral body to make sure that we are, if, you know, the uh, uh, objective that we set out in the work plan, but also in the blueprint yeah. and also in the vision. Uh, the third area uh, that I would like to also highlight is, you know, the ability to work with different people, yeah. uh, different partners he, uh, here in this case. Um, ASEAN is a multilateral platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, every time when I listen to our young uh, people and also policymakers, uh, when they're talking about ASEAN, uh, it seems to be a bit narrow. We tend to talk about, you know, the three pillars, uh, the chairmanship, uh, or the, you know, uh, activities of our young people and things like that. But one thing I want to remind our young people is that ASEAN is a platform where all parties come to the platform with different sets of interests, yeah. ideas, and views. It is a place for you to negotiate, to push, you know, to raise, and to lead. So it's not as simple as most people would believe. So it's very important that you know how to work with different people so that you can get your ideas move forward because it is a multilateral platform. You cannot do it alone. You know, you're not going to be the big boss yeah. at the uh, meeting table. So how you're going to build alliance, how you're going to build the uh, support, how you are going to get the views from different peoples and also understand the interests and how you're going to bridge your interests and other people's interests. Yeah. All of this are extremely important when it comes to the ASEAN meeting. You know, if you look at some of the key initiative, it seems easy. Yeah. You know, for yeah. example, we announced the establishment of the ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergency and Emerging Diseases. It sounds simple, but it's not that simple. You are having 10 uh, member states uh, are trying to have the center located in their own yeah. capital. Yeah. So how you are going to negotiate? And then you also have this situation that each member state has its own institution. How you are going to make sure that the institution that you propose is not going to affect the operations and work of the institutions that they already have in their own capital and so on. So it's, 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 it's a complex scenarios and uh, not just among the ASEAN member state, also with our partners as well. Uh, our partners come to the region because they all they also have a set of interests, some things that they want to advance, you know, through our platforms. And given the major power competition and so on, it's not going to be an easy uh, talk, you know, especially on some uh, difficult topics. Of course, we are going to touch on that later on yeah. when we are talking about the uh, major power competition in the region and so on. But I just want to uh highlight this and one thing that i want to share with our young people is that uh first you need to know what you are working on you know uh you cannot go to your partners or asian member state without being prepared enough you have to know every details of your proposal so when you are talking about it no one can you know push you back no one can question your uh, uh, ability and understanding the subject matters that you are proposing. Uh, secondly, uh, it's not enough, you know, to have good working relationship with uh, partners or ASEAN member state. You also need to have a strong personal relationship uh, with them as well. Yeah. The reason is very simple. You know, from time to time, you may have tough conversations. You don't always have good conversations on wine or foods, you know. Uh, Sometimes you have to have very, very tough conversations. And when such situation happens and with strong personal relationship, you also have the ability to, you know, get your thought across 
in a more open and frank uh, manner as well. Because sometimes you need that frankness. Sometimes you need that openness uh, to get things done. You cannot be so vague, mm -hmm. especially when you are trying to get somebody to support your ideas and so on. Yeah. So personal relationship is very important. It is some things that you need to continue to nurture. Uh, the third point here is the ability to uh, speak truth to the subject. You know, uh, some I'm, I'm a diplomat. You know, sometimes yeah. we try yeah. to not do some things that make our partner feel bad, right? I mean, yeah. saving face yeah. is Asian yeah. culture yeah. Yeah. or Asian yeah. culture in general. Yeah. Uh, but on some critical issues, I think we should be able to have this kind of truth conversation, offer our thought in a more candid manner so that our partners can also understand about our way of thinking and uh, especially our thought about the kind of uh, things that they want to bring to the table uh, and, 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 and so on. And the first point here is the ability to offer views, especially when you have conversation with big power. You know, I, I, I never have problems you know, talking with <laughs> colleagues from the US, from China, from Japan, from Korea. And, uh, you know, it is my utmost belief that, you know, uh, it is not just our partner that should have this uh, ability to uh, articulate idea or propose solutions. We should also be in that positions as well. And because of this strength and strategic thinkings, uh, most of the times, you know, uh, partners also come to me and uh, seek views on uh, some key areas as well, you know, talk to the EU ambassador, uh, you know, because he has this concern how we are going to push the uh, EU Green Deal, what I think, think about it and so on, and then what would be the uh, option that I can, you know, share with him and, 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 and so on. So these are, you know, some of the key uh, elements, you know, for you if you are engaging in multilateral platform like uh, ASEAN. Uh, of course, there are a lot more than this, but I just want to highlight, you know, uh, some key points. And hopefully some of this are useful, you know, for our uh, young people uh, going forward. The uh, fourth area is about strengthening the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, when I joined the ASEAN Secretariat, as the name suggests, right, it's yeah. the Secretariat. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, looking at the amount of work and the nature of work, uh, I just think that it's not just the Secretariat to the ASEAN member state, at least for the ASCC uh, pillar. Uh, actually, we have a very good relationship with ASEAN member state. And actually, ASEAN member state depend very, very much on the uh, resources, capacity, and capability of the ASEAN Secretariat staff. So at that point, I just feel, okay, it's about time you know, for us to transform you know, our role to become the knowledge hub for the ASEAN member state, not just, you know, servicing the meeting and all that. So you perhaps noticed that during my term, there's a lot of big publication. Yeah. Some of those publications are also uh, deep, you know, into the academic conversations. We are policymakers. We always talk about things we can do, we cannot do. <laughs> I mean, that's the natural kind of behaviors of all of us here working in the policy sphere. But at the time I said to my colleague, that's not enough. You know, uh, if we just do what we think we can do, then we are not going to be able to, you know, face the challenges that we don't know yet in the future. Or we already know, but we don't know yet about its magnitude and its uh, implication. So we need to be bold. We need to be, you know, uh, uh, ambitious. Uh, you know, not just uh, looking at things we uh, can do. Uh, so with this kind of mindset, then I start, you know, initiating a number of key uh, publications, for example, the ASEAN Development Outlook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the first time that we do it. And that's perhaps, you know, my first um, uh, initiative even before I joined the ASEAN Secretariat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I look at the World Bank, they have the World Development Report. I look at the UNDP, they have the Human Development Report. I look at the uh, ADB, they have the uh, Economic Outlook and all that. So I said, no, we have to have the ability to charter our development paths. We cannot depend on other people telling us what to do. We have to own the thinking here. 
So we start with this, and then uh, we have the uh, you know uh, ASEAN disaster resilient outlook, employment outlook, uh, migration outlook, gender outlook. Um, you know, uh, also the uh, uh, recently uh, uh, plan. Uh, for example, all the uh, seven platforms that are looking at, you know, some of the most critical uh, issues we are facing, climate change, future of work, future of education, uh, disaster management, uh, pandemic, poverty action, and so on. So I can say that ASEAN Secretariat, at least, you know, the ASCC is becoming a very strong body to support the ASEAN member state in this kind of work, you know, in thinking, in uh, analyzing, in uh, putting forward uh, bold strategies and uh, comprehensive uh, uh, framework uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, the fifth area that I uh, also want to highlight is uh, my contribution to the uh, promotion of ASEAN identity. Uh, we are not good in terms of telling people about who we are <laughs> or what we do. You know, it's very difficult for people to go around and look for documents yeah. uh, that they can understand more about ASEAN. Uh, because of this, uh, I uh, initiated, you know, two uh, key projects in addition to a number of others that we'll also highlight here. Uh, the first one is the ASEAN magazine. Um, at first, we rely pretty much on policy document, you know, declaration, uh, roadmap, uh, plan of actions, press release statement, and all that. And those are only for the uh, consumption of policymakers or our leaders. You know? But for the general public, they don't understand. They don't know what's going on. See, uh, it is not some things that they are familiar with. It's some things that are out of touch you know, for them. It's too far away from them to uh, be able to relate to. So I say to my colleague, you know, it's about time you know, to uh, write our story differently. We can't write our story this way. No one will understand it. And uh, it's not just about telling people uh, about our work. We should also give an opportunity for people to also tell us what they benefit from this uh, ASEAN uh, project as well. So if you look at the structure of the ASEAN magazine, you can see that, yeah. right? You, know, you, you, you can see the idea from our leader, but at the same time, story coming from our people as well telling us that, you know, they are helping, they are contributing, they are benefiting, and these are the areas that they want us to do more and so on. And I find it a very uh, healthy conversations. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the vision that I set out, you know, for this uh, uh, initiative is for it to become the bridge uh, between the leaders and the people uh, in shaping the direction of our community building process. Another key initiative uh, is going to be launched very soon is the ASEAN 101. Uh, it's a course. I, I just hope that our young people, we have an opportunity to learn and to understand more about ASEAN and all that. And uh, uh, we managed to uh, roll that out. And I hope that it's going to be very useful for uh, our young people uh, in learning about new things and yeah. also uh, understanding more about ASEAN. And that's just, you know, one of the uh, first step in terms of providing this kind of uh, knowledge uh, tools you know to our people uh, in the coming months and uh, next year perhaps we are going to also have the ASEAN uh, corner at the uh, library of the universities we are going to have the ASEAN sport zone uh, which will locate in the capital city of all the ASEAN member state so people can go there and do sport but at the same time have the history tool you know so they can also learn more about ASEAN uh, another proposal is also uh, uh, underway is, you know, to uh, establish the ASEAN Museum in the uh, Heretic Building and so on. So more people, when they come to Jakarta or students in Jakarta, when they come to visit ASEAN Secretariat, they can also go to the museum so that they can learn more about uh, our, you know, uh, uh, way of life, uh, our cultures, our tradition, uh, and so on. Uh, the uh, sixth area here is the uh, kind of thinkings that I uh, have, you know, uh, uh, based on my experience working at the ASEAN Secretariat and also uh, doing a lot of work with partners. Uh, 
maintaining our centrality uh, is our utmost uh, goal. It is something that we are trying our best to do. Uh, but in my opinion, we can only achieve this when we have more independence in terms of funding and thinking, yeah. right? If it depends on partner to do all of these activities on our behalf, then it's going to be very difficult for us because some of the projects are core you know, to our work and partner may not fund it and because of the lack of funding and then we cannot do it and it's going to have a lot of uh, uh, impacts on yeah. uh, how we operate, how we do things here. So I uh, start this, started this proposal you know, to establish the uh, CNA uh, and uh, through this uh, funding mechanisms, uh, you know, we can support some of the activities uh, so a CM member state, you know, don't have to depend too much on our partner for funding. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's also good, you know, for our identity buildings as well. Uh, it's going to be nice, for example, for, you know, our uh, fellow citizens in Lao PDR to receive some support from, you know, our fellow citizen from Cambodia, you know, through the ASEAN aid, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's from ASEAN people, you yeah. know. So it's good in terms of strengthening our uh, funding uh, capacity and capability, but also uh, promoting awareness. Uh, another thing is the uh, ability to think independently. I mean, if we don't have the ability to think, we depend very much on our partner to do all of this analysis on our behalf, then at the end of the day, most of, the, most of those ideas, you know, do not belong to you, or do yeah. not belong to me, right? <laughs> so we have to have our own people in the region who put the interests of the region ahead of all the other people's interests to do all of this work. That's why I propose to establish the ASEAN uh, Institute for Policy Studies. It's the think tank of ASEAN. Yeah. And if it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, agreed by all the uh, member states and it's going to be established, then this uh, think tank will uh, help the ASEAN member state in coming up with key strategies and helping the member state to come up with a positions on how we are going to respond to the uh, initiative or the uh, you know uh, a plan of all of our partner you can see that the indo pacific is a you know uh, it's become a an interesting swat of water here you yeah. know, there's so yeah. much competition at the moment you know and a lot of people are interested in you know uh, coming up with some uh, policies or visions on how they want to shape the region and so on. And in order for us to uh, be ahead of the curve and be prepared for all of this, we need to have our own strength. And we have to start with the ability to think, to chart our future directions, and also to you know, uh, uh, come up with plans that are ASEAN-oriented, you know, not uh, partners oriented kind of activities. The last point here is about my contribution to uh, what's going on in Myanmar. Okay. Uh, uh, I've been involved in Myanmar uh, issues since I joined the ASEAN Secretariat, you know, uh, first on the issues of the uh, repatriation of the refugee in Rakhine State. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when our leaders agreed on the five point consensus, uh, the fourth point, which is, you know, the provision of human drain assistance to Myanmar. Uh, all of this are under my uh, supervision because it is uh, disaster related uh, matters. So uh, I was responsible uh, in drafting uh, this uh, framework on how we are going to help uh, Myanmar in terms of uh, providing human drain assistance. Uh, it's not an easy to, it sounds uh, uh, okay, I mean, providing human resistance to a particular country, but we are operating in a complex situation here. So, you know, come, coming up with a plan that is uh, acceptable to all uh, ASEAN member states uh, and also uh, a credible plan that is also well received by our partner, it's not an easy design. So yeah. we have to make yeah. sure that it has all the elements that address all the people's uh, uh, concerns and interests and so on. And uh, as a result, you know, uh, based on this framework, and this framework is going to be used by, uh, you know, all the people, you know, when it comes to providing the uh, human resistance to Myanmar. 
for example, on the issue of, of accountability, I propose to establish the monitoring team, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to oversee the distribution and administration of all the uh, human resistance in Myanmar. And uh, this mechanism is, you know, to show people that all the processes are credible, accountable, transparent. So don't worry, you know, you can give me the money. Sure, and we can make sure. sure that all of this uh, needs will reach, you know, the people who need them the most. Uh, and with this framework, uh, we managed, you know, to mobilize around 10 million US dollars. It's not big yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some other partners are still, you know, uh, observing what's going on the ground so that they have enough confidence to contribute more. Uh, but we managed, you know, to send uh, the first batch uh, to Myanmar, uh, to the people of Myanmar, and the second, third, and fourth batch are also underway. So before I leave the ASEAN Secretariat, I'm trying to make sure that all of the uh, planning, you know, for the second, third, and fourth batch are ready. So uh, the team can, you know, uh, execute uh, straight away without having to wait for you know, for the deliberations on how we are going to do all of those. So uh, in summary, these are the seven points that I'd like to uh, share with you in terms of uh, my uh, achievement uh, to make it easy for people to understand how all of the things are, uh, yeah, are done yeah. and so on. But uh, there are uh, more uh, issues that we uh, take care of, not just, you know, uh, under the uh, seven areas that I just mentioned now. Thank you, sir. Uh, his Excellency, I think this quite in-depth uh, analysis and assessments of your uh, personal contribution to uh, uh, the ASEAN socio-cultural community and uh, your work in particular. And uh, very inspired by uh, your, your, your works, especially you mentioned a lot about uh, the initiative that we have never had before. And uh, it's going to be uh, playing a, a very important role in this community, especially to serve the people, youth in particular. So uh, mm -hmm. that's thank you for the contributions. And we, we hope to learn more from that uh, in the future and uh, to see this uh, continue to go uh, uh, in the upcoming decade and so on. Uh, so uh, my next questions, because uh, there's uh, up to seven points, uh, and then uh, can you think of uh, one of the, uh, your accomplishment that you feel most proud of? Uh, anything that you believe uh, you feel most proud of? Well, uh, again, uh, all the uh, seven, or at least some of them are interrelated, right? Uh, but if uh, I would need to choose, you know, one among the seven is my, uh, you know, ability to uh, kind of, you know, get closer to the vision in terms of uh, putting in place regional institutions uh, that would help ASEAN to navigate many more years to come. I don't like to have this uh, short term thinking. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, some things that you are going to benefit in a matter of two or three years, but it is some things that are going to shape uh, ASEAN in the next 50 years, for example. So if, uh, you know, I can kind of uh, highlight, uh, for example, the establishment of the ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies, or oh, it's the ASEAN CDC. Yeah. It's been around for more than 10 years. People cannot do it. So when the pandemic hit, I said, now it is the time, you know, uh, Something you can do in normal time, something you cannot do in normal time. And there's also things that you can do during the crisis. Yeah, and this yeah. is one of those things that you can do during the crisis now. So start doing something about it. Yeah. And yeah. this institution is going to have, you know, uh, impacts on how we deal with uh, future shock in many, many more years to come. So if you ask me what I'm proud of the most is, you know, my contribution to uh, building the regional institution and framework that would assist ASEAN to navigate all of this in the next 50 years. Yeah, that's great. In the meantime, uh, I think uh, before we move to uh, your, your, your view on the ASEAN integration and, and also the other important work in, in, in particular like climate change and how you have uh, uh, created uh, some other initiative that focus on people uh, oriented and people centered community. So I, I would like to know that's, that's just a simple question, but I think mm -hmm. uh, you might need to reflect. Uh, are there any thing 
you feel regret not being able to complete or to do during your term. Three year term is quite short to me. So there might be something that you uh, are unable to do or to complete within the period. Right. Yes, um, there's one uh, for sure. And it's a very, very big one. <laughs> um, as you rightly pointed out, three years is very short when you are working you yeah. Know, yeah. on uh, cross-sectoral and transboundary kind of issues. You know, it is not some things that happening at the village level or provincial level. This is concerned the entire region. So coming up with idea, putting all of those ideas into details, mobilizing support, getting them implemented. Yeah. It's a long process. So for the first year, we managed to put in place some of the most important initiative. And it took us six months to one year to actually turn all of those into concrete steps and activities but then pandemic hit all the focus moved to pandemic. you know uh, containing the uh, pandemic and then we don't have enough time and resources to do uh, other things of course all of the other activities are uh, continue to be uh, continuing to be implemented by the asim of the state and also a civic period but it's not you know to the fullest of its capacity and capability uh, and then uh, to the very end of my tenure at the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, I start, you know, uh, focusing on the uh, sustainability question as well, because I feel this, you know, I'm, 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 I'm addressing all of the key questions under the human health and human uh, security. But then when it comes to our planet, I think we should also do something about it. We also owe a lot to our planet as well. Um, there's one key initiative that we do that is the uh, ASEAN Green Initiative. That's also my vision uh, to increase the green space in the ASEAN region, you know, to make the ASEAN greener and more sustainable and so on. So we introduced this uh, ASEAN Green Initiative. The idea is to, one, one of the key activities is to uh, plant uh, more trees. You know, they have this slogan, 10, 10, 10, you know, 10 million trees for 10 years for 10 ASEAN member states. Uh, some people would ask, you know, 10 million is not a big number, yeah. but look at it as a campaign. It's not an actual activity because member state need to own it. You know, ASEAN Secretariat cannot do all of this planting. It has to be the ASEAN member state. It has to be our young people. It has to be the community and so on. So when we put this out, you know, to help green the region a bit more, uh, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, although we put in the papers the commitment of 10 million tree, uh, suddenly some of members increase it, you know, uh, exponentially. Uh, <laughs> some even promised to plant 1 billion tree in 10 years. Oh. So suddenly you have almost 1.5 billion trees commitment from the ASEAN member state. That's a huge things, but that's not enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, if you're talking about, you know, the rising temperatures or the rising sea level, and you want to address this problem of climate change, uh, you cannot just address it from the uh, absorption side. Yeah. I mean, we plant tree because we believe that all of trees will absorb the carbon dioxide and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we need to do some things on the emitting size as well. Yeah. Cars, factory, and so on. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when it, gets closer to the end of my tenure, start thinking, okay, I still need a comprehensive plan to, 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 to tackle this problem. We cannot do it a bit here and there. Yeah. We need a comprehensive ASEAN Green Deal that would allow us to address the problems of climate change from many angles, manufacturing, production, consumption, circular economy, infrastructure, urbanizations, conservations, we need to put all of this under one framework so that when we are fighting the issues of sustainability, degradation, or climate change, we have a better chance of overcoming it. So you ask me some things that I would want to do if I'm still with the ASEAN Secretariat is to push this ASEAN Green Deal. And uh, if we manage to do it, it's going to be, you know, uh, 
a once in a generation kind of uh, document uh, for CN to uh, uh, address, you know, the, ma the, the major challenges that it faced. So if, 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 if there's some things I would, you know, uh, rank this as the first one, some things that I really hoped uh, to do, but it is also some things that you cannot achieve in a year time. Yeah, it's yeah. A, a, a comprehensive framework. It's going to take around two to three years for all of us to have such a comprehensive document for us to work on. Yeah, that 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 inspiring, especially when you mentioned uh, the words ASEAN uh, Green Deal. I think that I, I like it more, and I uh, would love to see this happening in the future. Uh, so, and also. Even after your term, I believe that you will be engaging with this uh, work and so on to push for, for more action on that. And we see, more, for example, like planting more trees, at least they show commitment to do so at the end of this. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, maybe in the next 10 years they will do so. And also address with that the uh, environmentally, uh, ch environmental challenges that we face, climate change, right, or sea level, uh, the energy transition and so on. Yeah. So let me move to uh, ASEAN. ASEAN actually turned 54 years this, this year, this uh, 2021. Uh, but like many regions, it has been uh, undergoing a very uh, unprecedented challenges driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. So from uh, with you from uh, within, uh, you personally, uh, how do you view the, 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 the regions or the organization in particular? Uh, especially uh, the process of social cultural community building. You mentioned a lot about the the, the, the things that uh, we have done. Uh, we are moving forward, but of course uh, the the challenge is quite huge. That uh, it disrupts uh, the, the the process of us or the, the the anticipation of achieving something by, for example, like 2025 and so on. So it's just uh, it's a big disruption. So how do you see this at this? How do, how do you see this organization within the 40, uh, 54 years old? Well, um, you know, uh, the challenges uh, ASEAN is facing now are tremendous. You know, I have to say so. Yes, uh, perhaps I should, you know, uh, highlight just five mega trends. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. course, there are also other trends that are affecting the uh, work and future of ASEAN. But if I could, I should, you know, highlight only five for now. Uh, and then, you know, in the future, we have the opportunity to, to, to have more conversations on. Yes, yeah, and then yeah. we can discuss more. Yeah. And I believe that these five mega trends are going to shape. They actually already shape the ways we do, the way we live, and the kind of future we will be in. The first one is the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. It happened even before the uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps a little bit of the history, um, you know, automation uh, was always part of the society, you know, since our beginning of, you know, uh, settling down as a community or as a society, right? you depend on horse, cows, and, you know, to help you do the agriculture and uh, some tools, you know, to help you do uh, a number of things by hand. So it's not a new thing. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, the arrival of the steam engine and then the arrival of the uh, electricity, uh, uh, internet, and now the uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and all of the uh, technology uh, related products and so on. So it's not, it's not a new thing. It's just a process. But what's going on is the speed of, of change that matters. Uh, you know, uh, in the past, it took like 200 years before mm -hmm. you reach another milestone, right? Yeah. And yeah. then another, you know, seven or 80 years before you reach another milestone. For example, computer, we found it back in the 1950. Uh, but until 2000, when I uh, study in high school, uh, was the first time that I touched the keyboard, right? So it's 50 years still trying to find its place, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah, even yeah. now, uh, we are not making full potentials of it yet. So 70 or 80 years, something like that. But what's going on with the fourth industrial revolution is that the time for adjustment becomes very short. It only takes a few years for you to adjust. You know, it's not like 70 year or 80 years for you anymore, right? I mean, That's for right. example, That's the right. steam engine uh, from the early 19th uh, century and it's almost the 1960s or, or, or 70s, some of our uh, 
uh, technology was still uh, used by many, many countries. So that's uh, more than 100 years or something. So the adjustment time is very, uh, very long, uh, which is very different from the one that we are having now. Uh, another uh, key difference is the way that it affects uh, how it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking over some of the jobs of the people. In the past, it's more of, you know, helping us to do uh, things that we repeatedly do more efficient. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. Assembling or, you know, uh, 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 doing the agricultural work and so on. But for the first industrial revolution, although we don't know the full scale of it, according to the report by the World Economic Forum, uh, 40 or 50% of the jobs that may be uh, created as a result of the uh, fourth industrial revolution are not yet known. Mm -hmm. Some things that you wait until 2030 or 2040 before you know that those skills are, are existing. So we don't know yet about that. But what we can say is that the pace of change and the kind of skills that the fourth industrial revolution is going to uh, affect will be uh, unprecedented, right? Uh, since the introduction of all of these technologies, all of these technologies are never able to replace our analytical thinking, critical thinking, problem solving. Yeah. Now you don't need a lawyer to advise you on the financial situation you face. You can just sit in front of the uh, computer and then the computer can advise you. Why? Because of big data. Yeah. The computer store a lot of information and data. And uh, you know, from all the cases that all the best lawyers are defending. Yeah. Right, and now you just put the case in the computer, and then they just you know uh, go through all the previous practices, uh, yeah. ways that all of the best uh, lawyers are doing, and so on, and then they can give you the best advice, you know, in a matter of five minutes or even less. So that is the concerning part. So what what we are what we are doing to address all of that? You, but I I I I only focus, you know. Um, the responses from the ASCC side. I will, yeah. I will leave it to my uh, colleague from the economic side to tackle it from a different angle. From the ASCC side, uh, two sectors that are affected the most by this. The first one is the labor sector and the second one is the education sector. And because of this, you know, uh, back in 2019, I proposed, you know, let's have a robust framework to uh, help ASEAN member state in navigating this. Although we don't know, uh, you know, uh, those kind of jobs in the future, but it's not correct to say that we don't know anything. We know some things is coming. We know some forms of it. We know the sources of, you know, uh, uh, problems. Uh, so this should be enough for us in terms of kind of planning something about it. And uh, it's always good to have some sort of, you know, planning to address it. So we have this uh, ASEAN, uh, you know, roadmap, you know, on the uh, development of human resources in the region. Uh, and if you look at the roadmap and also its action plan, uh, it's not just about providing the 21st century skills, you know, the STEM skills, yeah. innovation yeah. skills, and so on, but also another set of skills that are also extremely uh, important for our young people. Um, all of those hard skills are important because they are going to be the foundation. But what our young people need is to, to depend on those basic skills and to adapt quickly to the changing labor market. Basic skill you need, you can't you yeah. can do without yeah. it. But it's going to be there. It's not going to change, you know, mathematics, physics, chemistry, science, technology, engineering, they are fixed. They're not moving anywhere there. But the soft skill will allow you to make use of it and then turn it into some things that will be useful, relevant, and helpful to you. That's why in the uh, roadmap or framework, we also emphasize you know, the uh, uh, soft skills that would allow our young people to adapt, to learn, and change quickly so that they will not get stuck if the pace of change is going too fast. The same for the education sectors. So all of these two sectors need to work together to address these problems. 21st century skills, of course, uh, science skills, of course, basic skills, of course, 
but also the kind of uh, soft skills that would allow them to uh, navigate this in a more uh, resilient uh, manner as well. And we can't do it alone. We need to work with the private sectors because at the end of the day, uh, the private sectors will hire all of these people to work in their company. So they should also play a role in this. And it's not just about learning in schools. It is some things that, you know, our young people, we need to learn for the entire life. That's why we also, you know, focus on the lifelong learning uh, as well. And for the lifelong learning, it's not just about learning in a proper uh, education institution. You can learn anywhere. You can learn through different ways of uh, uh, learning, right? For example, I myself enjoy very much, you know, from time to time, uh, enroll in a course on MOOC, for example, financial markets or even pandemic or even cryptocurrency yeah. or even some social science courses and so on. Yeah. So I, I, I encourage our young people to, 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 to look at these opportunities and, and, and to uh, you know, uh, improve themselves so that they can be equipped uh, and, and, and be able to navigate this, uh, you know, troubling time, challenging time more effectively. The second uh, challenge is the uh, demographic change. Um, our society is aging very quickly. Yeah. It's very unnatural. For example, in the case of Japan, you know, in the history of human being, uh, what's the first time that the numbers of old people is, is more than the numbers of children? Yeah. So we are facing the uh, crisis of not having enough young people to replace the old generations. And it's going to be a crisis. We don't know yet, you know, what, what would be the, the, the situations there. Uh, ASEAN region is not yet at that point, but we are going there very quickly as well. The numbers of our old people is increasing. Uh, fertility rate is uh, slowing down and more and more people don't want to have many children uh, and uh, you know when you get to the point that one adult uh, has to support one uh, old person then the whole system becomes uh, unsustainable because you don't have enough you know to take care of the uh, old people uh, the lack of resources and also if you are doing it that way then you don't have enough resources for our younger generations as well so in a way, you're also wrapping their future uh, as well. So for us, how we are going to deal with this, there's a number of interventions that we introduced over the years. For example, some country increased the retirement age. Uh, old people can continue to work, although they you know, <laughs> pass the retirement age yeah. and so on. Uh, and then we also look at how we can uh, equip them with skills. You know, uh, they are old. They don't have the energy. They don't have the... Uh, physical strength to do things, but it doesn't mean that they cannot contribute, you know, it's just that they would, that we have to contribute in a different way. And in this case, 4IR is not a bad thing, you know, 4IR can help all the people contribute in a new way. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to pull or push the cart, but then they can also make use of artificial intelligence, uh, technologies, computer to help them to do things. And with a lot of experience in Dealing with so many uh, issues, we can seize the potentials of uh, our older persons in uh, addressing of all of these problems as well. We are also helping them to live a healthy life, uh, what we call uh, healthy, active, and productive aging. Wow. So you get old in a productive manner, in a healthy manner, and also in an active manner. Uh, and that if it is something that we can do, then it's going to help us reduce the cost and so on. Uh, touching a little bit on the economic related matters, uh, the gray economy is going to be something uh, very important in the future. You know? Gray here is the uh, color <laughs> of the hair of our old people. Uh, the products that we design at, the, at, at, at this point is only for the young people, you know, all of this, you know, cool stuff, you know, for young people to use and so on. But one thing you have to also remember that these old people also have a lot of resources. You know, they've been yeah, working for yeah. their life, for the entire life. So when they retire, they retire with a lot of money as well. And sometimes they feel that, you know, the economy is not for them. You know, the economy is only for the young, uh, young people and yeah. so on. So the 
a great economy is going to be some things that you are going to see in the future and it should be some things that our young people you know should uh, focus uh, in terms of you know uh, coming up with uh, innovative ideas on how you can provide those kind of services to our old people uh, also we are also wrapping up the uh, ramping up you know the uh, 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 you know, support for the uh, healthcare systems so that it can support you know our, our older uh, person in a more humane and effective manner and also sustainable manner because it costs a lot of money and so on so demographic change is going to be a, a, a challenge for us and the you know uh, going with it is the urbanizations you know the, uh, the the city becomes big and big and then all the issues that we face in terms of you know public uh, uh, services or uh, resources or the environmental uh, problems that arise from this uh, urbanization and so on so demographic change i just want to put them all together under this uh, all of this uh, key trends under one uh, or group here the uh, demographic change the third one is the um, you know, climate change. Uh, of course, you know, everyone knows uh, the problem with climate change is the uh, common good, right? It's not, yeah. it's not the cost of any individual person, you know? So we always have this uh, problems of, uh, you know, uh, common good, the tragedy of the common, the common good here. People, you know, just make use of it and don't care much because they feel that, you know, it is not something that they should, you know, shoulder in terms of, uh, providing all the costs and so on but if we don't do something about it it's going to affect uh, our life uh, and also it's very unfair for our younger generation uh, that now we can enjoy you know uh, destroying the world the planet and all that uh, and without having to be responsible for all the impact but our generations uh, many more to come are going to bear the brunt of this uh, activities, irresponsible activity. So there are numbers of key initiatives that we put in place. The ASEAN Green Deal, I told you earlier. Uh, another uh, key uh, initiative is the uh, State of Climate Change Report. It's the first time we do it. When I started this idea, you know, some of my colleagues came to me, DSG is not going to be possible, you know. Uh, member state may not like the idea because you are assessing uh, you know, the progress. And some may feel that, you know, they're not living up to the expectation and they don't want people to, to know that. Yeah, I yeah. said, no, uh, this is uh, good for them also. By identifying the gaps, we can know what we can help them. So it's not entirely a bad thing here. Uh, find a way to help them to, 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 to navigate the issue of climate change is for their own good. It's not just for the uh, good of the whole region here. So we uh, received the support from the assembly the state at the end, and the state of climate change will be available very soon. And uh, I suggest you know all of our people to uh, go through the documents um, and look at the baseline uh, study, uh, a lot of data uh, that will tell you you know what we are at the moment and what we need to do more. And all the commitments that a senior member state, you know, uh, put in this uh, key document so that they can uh, achieve more. Uh, on the biodiversity side, we are also doing some things uh, about it. You know, I've been working very closely uh, with the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity and guiding them on uh, a number of key uh, initiatives uh, to uh, protect the biodiversity, uh, including the uh, protections and uh, preventions of the uh, uh, wife life and all that yeah. Uh, yeah and 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 also you know uh, uh to make sure that the asian region will uh, accomplish the uh you know uh haste free uh vision uh, so that our people would not be affected by all of this haste uh, pm 2.5 you know sometimes as a result of the uh, forest fire uh, but most of the times it is also the result of all the cars that are rambling yes. you know, on the street in the major cities and so on. Um, the uh, first point here is the pandemic. Um, you like it or not, it's going to be with us for uh, a, number, a number more of years. Uh, although it's easy for us to kind of say that we can live with the COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, one reality we have to accept is that uh, how many people are we willing to uh, accept that they are going to die from this uh, COVID-19? Uh, and that's not just the uh, 
you know, difficult reality that ASEAN member states are facing, but it is also a miserable reality that all the countries around the world face. Because if you leave with the virus, it means that you allow the uh, uh, outbreak to happen from time to time in different places, right? So when you have people infected by COVID-19, some may be serious, require hospitalization and so on. Some may make it, some may not make it. Yeah. So what we need to do is, you know, to make sure that if you are leaving with uh, the COVID-19, you have a proper plan, you know, uh, strengthening the healthcare systems, uh, putting in place a strong surveillance system so you know uh, very quickly if there's an outbreak somewhere so that you can contain it okay. quickly yeah. as well. Uh, you need to uh, uh, make sure that you have all the vaccines in stock. If there's a need for you to vaccinate people, you can vaccinate very quickly. Uh, vaccinate, vaccination is not the panacea. Uh, you need to also focus on uh, therapeutic and diagnostic. Uh, diagnostic now, although it's uh, widely available, but it's not yet convenient and it's still costly, right? I mean, you have to use this you yes. know, with your nose and throw all the time. It's not that convenient. And I can see that some of the ASEAN member states are trying to do something about it. For example, uh, you can blow to the, yeah. uh, the, the tool and then it can analyze. Some people can also use this uh, special liquid that you gargle and then you can uh, also you know, uh, put in the uh, test device and it can give you the results in 15 minutes or something. Uh, another thing is therapeutic. Um, uh, there's some good news, you know, some uh, key uh, development at the moment. Uh, for example, the drug produced by Merck uh, yes. is, is going to help, you know, uh, reduce the uh, severe illness by 50% or something. And that's good news. We need more of those as well. Yeah. Because you yeah. live with COVID-19, people will be infected. They will be hospitalized. And when they are hospitalized, we yeah. have this yeah. therapeutic to provide them. And then we can save more life. Yeah. Uh, in terms of ASEAN uh, responses to COVID-19, uh, under my, you know, supervisions and leadership, um, at the times I, you know, uh, put in place uh, five main strategies. The first one is to strengthen the regional mechanisms, and that is the uh, establishment of the ASEAN uh, Center for Public Health Emergency and Emerging Disease, in addition to the. Uh, regional uh, framework, you know, to, to help the ASEAN member state to respond. Second is data, timely, online, and also quality one. Yeah. And that's why we have the ASEAN portal for uh, public health emergency. I encourage everyone to go to that port portal. Uh, uh, it, it provides all the details, all the information, all the data on how ASEAN member state is responding to this. Third area is knowledge. Uh, when you are fighting such a virus, you have to be smarter than the virus itself. Yeah. And in order to be smarter than the virus, you have to change ideas, views on how you are addressing it. Each country has different ways or diff different uh, lesson learned or story to share. So we set up uh, this panel, you know, to allow the uh, ASEAN member state to uh, share ideas and learn something from our partner, from the US, from the EU, Japan, China, Korea, and so on. The fourth area is you have to make sure that when such a crisis hit, we have a, enough stockpile to support the ASEAN member state. So we're having this ASEAN regional, you know, uh, 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 stockpile, uh, you know, for the uh, PPE uh, and uh, a member state can have access to uh, those uh, PPE and, 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 and so on. Uh, another uh, important area is the uh, mobilization of resources. I've been working very closely with all the partners, you know, to make sure that we can get some uh, support, uh, not just in terms of money, but also uh, in-kind contributions as well, like PPE, uh, vaccines, medicines to support the uh, ASEAN member state. Of course, there are also many other issues that we need to take call uh, as well. For example, the, the medical waste as a result yeah. of the uh, COVID-19. Okay. Uh, we have to also, you know, pay more attention to the uh, slum and illegal settlement uh, because people tend to live, you know, crowded. Yeah, crowded. And if there's an there's an outbreak there, and then a lot of people will be uh, infected very quickly uh, as well. Uh, and the fifth one, uh, and that is the uh, internal political situation and the major power competition. <laughs> the internal political situation, of course, that's Myanmar. Yeah. Um, it's 
in in a way it, it it's it's going to be some things that we define as seen as a, a community that's why uh, our leaders are so uh, concerned and uh, working very closely together you know trying to put things back on the right path uh, if you ask me it's going to be an easy one i don't think it's going to be an easy one the problem has been there for many many years you know, uh, perhaps in the independent of Myanmar yeah. itself from yeah. the British. Uh, so what we can do is to kind of to show our, you know, friends from Myanmar, you know, what is good for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the kind of uh, platform or dialogue that uh, ASEAN, you know, can continue to provide to uh, narrow down in terms of the differences among all the different groups of people. Uh, and also what kind of support that we can provide, you know, to the people of Myanmar uh, so that we can uh, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, because of this political situation and the life and livelihood of the people are not affected very much. Uh, ASEAN member state also have a lot of experience to share. Cambodia in particular uh, has a lot of things to uh, share with our colleague from uh, Myanmar uh, as well. At the end of the day, you know, people need to learn to live together here. It's like what they need to live with the COVID-19 and so on. It's not going to be an easy co-accommodation or something, but it is some things that, you know, they, they have to, uh, to, to do, you know, uh, if uh, they want to be a productive and uh, uh, effective uh, member of the community that they need to contribute more. Uh, when it comes to the major power, you have the, you know, um, uh, competition between the uh, United States and China on trade related matters. Uh, and then uh, there are a number of key uh, mechanisms that are arising in the uh, regions as well. You have the Quad, you have the AUKUS, you have the yeah. Indo Pacific uh, strategies from all the major power, you know, even the uh, medium power. Uh, for example, Germany also has this Indo Pacific outlook. Uh, <laughs> you know, so many people are having this kind of key document for ASEAN. Uh, we don't want to be part of those. Uh, what we want is, you know, for all of those mechanisms to complement the uh, regional architectures that we establish. Uh, and this is some things that we consistently uh, tell our partners, no matter what you want to do, you have to think about how the things that you propose, we also complement the regional architectures that we yeah. put in place. Asking us to choose side, it's not going to be possible. We are not going to choose side. Uh, the reason that ASEAN is progressing is because we are open to all partners. We work very closely with all partners and we find ways on how we can co-prosper or co-address the problems that we uh, face, no matter how hard the question, including the territorial problems that we are having in the uh, region. So in addition to that, it's... Uh, uh, you know, clear from the ASEAN uh, regions uh, as well that we need to have a strategies that clearly uh, articulate our position so people can know that these are my positions. And if you want to work on, for example, Indo-Pacific related mat matters, then these are the framework, these are the uh, uh, blueprints for you to, to, to work with us and, and, and so on. Uh, another thing, ASEAN, we can you to uh, play a productive role in uh, narrowing the... Uh, uh, gulf of differences, you know, between yeah, our yeah. partners. Uh, we have a numbers of key uh, platforms that are uh, serving as a strategic uh, ways of, you know, uh, bridging uh, the gap here. And uh, I think all the major powers are still, you know, giving uh, a lot of uh, significance to all of these platforms. And they are keen, you know, to engage from time to time, uh, you know, to uh, address their differences. Uh, what is important here that I would like to share is that uh, at the end of the day, um, no matter how big the uh, differences you have, uh, at the same time, there are also things that you can uh, do together as well. And it is impossible for you, you know, to build trust and confidence from where you are different. You can only build trust and confidence from where you are the same or similar. So this is some things that we keep, you know, uh, advising our partner. You know, let's let's look at something we can do together. For example, all partners are interested in fighting the climate change. Yeah. So that one entry point. All of us are eager to 
recover from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, by reinvigorating our economy and so on. Let's work together on that. Everyone cares about the livelihood of the people. Let's work together on that, right? So all of this key initiative should serve as the, you know, uh, a basis for all the major power to start working together, to build trust and confidence. And then perhaps when the time is right, then they can bring back all of these contentious issues and find a way to settle. Yeah. This is Alancy. This is very comprehensive, and uh, you not only highlight uh, you not only highlighting the the issue facing the region at it for uh, at fifty four years old, but you also offer us uh, solutions. Uh, what ASEAN has been doing to deal with it very impressive, and uh, I I just want to uh, point it out one thing uh, that I totally and strongly agree with you when when it comes to climate crisis the calamity that uh, the younger generation is going to uh, uh, encounter in the upcoming years, because now we already see the extreme weather events uh, occurring uh, in all, almost everywhere around the world. And ASEAN is, is, is one of the most uh, vulnerable regions. Um, and this is uh, important that we, we, we work together to address that. But the problem that you mentioned, uh, we always see that as a, a transboundary, a common good, and something that nobody is responsible for. But that's why we seek for, we're not saying that climate justice is a, is a, a thing that most country want to do, especially uh, the, the, the developing country, that those who are suffering more from this. But of course, you need to have a, a justice for them uh, because they don't actually polluting the world uh, and taking benefit of it, but they are the one who suffer more. So we hope that we, we are going to have that uh, addressed uh, in the future. And people, especially if they won't see themselves as too small, you can do something, uh, especially your part, uh, encouraging people and country to, to plant tree energy transition and so on. That's great. Uh, I think I have two more questions. I think we have been going through uh, like over one hour, but I think I really enjoyed uh, the session very much. So uh, my, my next questions uh, would be, uh, because I think six years ago when uh, the, we began the, the so-called, uh, the, the start of, uh, the start of uh, community, uh, community, ASEAN community in integration, what, we, what most people think, that the major concern is about the gap knowledge of the people in the regions, uh, how much do you know from amongst yourself and, and, and the other country, for example, how much Cambodian uh, knows about Singapore uh, culture, people, and so on, and, and how much Singaporean people knows about Indonesian, Malaysian, or maybe they are too close, but that still remains an issue. So we, we, we consider that as the most important thing that would be a continuing a, a major roadblock for, for us to move forward. But right now, I see a lot of young people that aspire to learn about the regions. They are aspire to communicate, to build connectivity and so on. Do you see that there's no longer a problem? And, and, and how you, do you use or your own perception uh, that would use in particular? How do you see ASEAN use right now on what are doing right now uh, to uh, support community integrations? Um, if I can put this, I would look at it, you know, from diff uh, four different angles. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, promoting awareness and understanding among the ASEAN people about our diversities, our cultures, yeah. our uniqueness, uh, it's not going to be a project that can be you know, specify with times. Yeah. There is some things that we need to continue to do uh, through, you know, different ways of uh, communications. Uh, earlier, I'm talking about the ASEAN magazines, the uh, yeah. ASEAN 101 and so on. But now when it comes to uh, youth in particular, I, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the, you know, strengthenings of the uh, capacities of our young people and also providing them an opportunity to move around so that they can also uh, not just learn about the skills that they need, but also the people, tradition, culture, and so on. Uh, that's why, you know, I uh, propose to establish the ASEAN scholarship. And I hope that this scholarship will be launched uh, later next year. And the first phase of the scholarship will be, you know, from 2022 to 2025. Uh, and uh, for this uh, pilot phase, we are looking at providing 400 scholarship to ASEAN national 
to do their master degree in the University in the ASEAN region. So this is not just about you know, building capacity, but also a mobility programs that will allow our young people to go to different parts of the regions, learn about the local culture, local food, people, language, and then they can appreciate you know, being different and also uh, the same yeah. uh, at the same yeah. time. Uh, another key uh, initiative that I also propose is the ASEAN Youth Volunteer. Uh, normally, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when it comes to the volunteer programs that ASEAN has in the past, uh, for example, you are involving in activities, you know, cultural activities or sport activities or uh, organizing events and all that. Uh, and those are uh, activities that are related to uh, youth volunteer. But the youth volunteer that I propose, it costs more than 1.5 million or something just for one year. Wow. Uh, so we are going to send a group of 10 ASEAN national young people, 10 per group to each AMS. So you have 10 group for 10 AMS. And each group, you have one representative from each country. And these 10 peoples are going to work with the local community for a particular uh, purpose. For example, they can, uh, the, the themes of the volunteer will change from time to time. Uh, it, it was a bit unfortunate, actually, we are we were, we were planning to, to roll out the youth volunteer for the first times uh, back in 2020, but because of the COVID-19, we couldn't do it. The themes at the time was on disaster management. So we want our young people to go to the uh, disaster affected area, uh, help the local communities uh, to recover from the disasters and so on. And through this uh, uh, volunteer, it's not just about building the bond among them, but also for them to uh, appreciate and also uh, you know, contributing to the ASEAN community building uh, uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, hopefully uh, things get better and then our young people can have that opportunity. The third area is to provide platform for them to share their views. And this is not just about uh, for them to listen. You know, most of the times when it comes to engaging our young people, what I see is that we tend to tell them what they should think. Yeah. They should. Right. For example, if somebody asked me, um, you know, as the DSG for ASCC, they would say, oh, you are, you know, a uh, very wise person. Uh, you can also share a lot of ideas, you know, to our young people, what they should do, should live their life and things like that. Uh, it's good. It's not a bad thing, right? I mean, there's always some uh, wisdom, uh, lesson learned experiences, including, you know, uh, failures that our young people can learn from all of this uh, high level people and so on. But my view is that I also want to hear from them, you know, what they want to do for the uh, common good, for the betterment of all the people in the ASEAN region. That's why, you know, I'm trying to establish a number of platforms that would allow our young people to also share their views. For example, the ASEAN uh, use uh, pla uh, uh, platform, uh, no, sorry, ASEAN use forum, yeah. Uh, which is similar to the EU uh, Youth Forum. Uh, actually, it's, uh, it was planned to, uh, to be uh, implemented here in uh, Cambodia in Siem Reap province. But because of the COVID-19, we couldn't do it. So uh, uh, we look at next year, you know, whether we can do it physically. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, ASEAN Youth from all the ASEAN member states. Uh, they are going to share uh, uh, their views on how we can uh, tackle the problems that we face, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the solutions, the ideas, and the reason why we are in this crisis and so on. And it's not just about you know, providing an opportunity for them to share what we need to do to address the problem, but also an opportunity for them to engage with the ministers, you know, uh, high level people, so that they, they can build their confidence. Yeah. And at the yeah. same time, they can also uh, articulate their solutions and uh, views and so on. The fourth uh, area here is, now you give them an opportunity to tell you what they think good for the region. You give them the opportunity to tell you what are the solutions to the problems that we face. But in my view, what is even more important is to give them an opportunity to try their ideas, yeah. not just to say about them. So just you know, before I leave the ASEAN Secretariat, I task my uh, staff to work on uh, this project. And I hope that we can implement it next year. 
Uh, it's the, the the topic is the marine plastic debris. It's the plastic yeah. waste that we dump into the river and ocean. Uh, and we are going to have a small grant, for example, twenty thousand or thirty thousand or something. And then uh, our young people can work individual or in group, uh, submit the proposal, get the money, yeah. and try yeah. out. You know, for example, they may say that you know we we, we can use this app to track uh, the waste in the uh, city. And now I give you 30,000, you do it. And I want to see how effective it is. And some of this idea can be scaled up. Some of this idea can become, you know, very important tool for the government to tackle the problems in the future and so on. So giving them the opportunity to, you know, voice their concerns, share their view, offer a solution, good, but not enough. We need to also provide them resources so that they can truly implement all of the views and solutions that they think uh, are good for the uh, region. So in short, you know, I would, you know, summarize how, uh, you know, we can further promote the participation of our young people. And at the same time, you know, the awareness about the ASEAN communities uh, yeah, through yeah. these four main points. Of course, again, as I say, uh, there are also a lot of activities going on at the moment at the ASEAN level and national level in engaging our young people in many, many of this activity. Uh, we can't say that our young people is the pillar of our future development, yeah. uh, but we have to make sure that this pillar is a strong concrete with all the steels and right proportion of sand and cement and everything <laughs> so that the pillar can you know, stand strong and support the, uh, uh, the roof of our future for many, many more years to come. Uh, it's not just about you know, saying nice things about uh, our young people but also you know, being willing uh, to say some tough things to our young people uh, as well, uh, uh, especially when they're not living up to the expectation or they're not doing enough. Because you know, that kind of uh, role responsibilities are not given. It is some things that our young people need to earn and they need to earn by working hard. And in order for them to work hard to earn it, we have to provide them all the support create an enabling environment so that they can also do it. Thank you, Excellency. I think uh, I can't agree more with your, your, your points when it comes to youth empowerment, because uh, we have a lot of potential youth, but the lack of opportunity and mentorship, and like you mentioned, enabling uh, uh, environments that can help them thrive in their own environment and so on. So hopefully we will be able to move forward with that. And then my final question, uh, Excellency, uh, because uh, we are gearing up toward uh, the end of this uh, uh, year, uh, 2021, and move to 2000, uh, 2022, in which Cambodia is set to host a very important uh, sub, uh, summit, and a series of, of meetings will be uh, held. I'm not really sure will be it will be entirely uh, virtual or it will be in in, in a physical format and so on. But of course, that's very important because uh, the regional cropping will be uh, led by uh, Cambodia chairmanship. This is the third time, it's not the first time, but of course, um, uh, uh, first and second, and now the third time is in the middle of pandemic and uh, there are a lot of problems facing the regions that you mentioned earlier. Great power competition is going uh, uh, to be really uh, quite tense at some point because uh, we see more initiative and more mechanism to uh, we are not sure what they're doing but of course that uh, how they compete for uh, for their power and so on so that's a little bit challenges and then also internal power for example like the Myanmar crisis a lot of people are expecting Cambodia to take a, a little bit more concrete role in delivering this uh, the result for example like uh, if Brunei is, is not able to send uh, the, of course, the special invoice, and then it would be uh, transferred that passed to Cambodia and a lot more humanitarian uh, crisis and so on. So to use as a, a, a deputy secretary general, uh, you've been dealing with a wide range of issue. What are your takes on Cambodia chairmanship, the upcoming chairmanship, and then what issue you believe Cambodia should pay more attention to? Um, I think, uh, you know, there will be uh, a lot of uh, key initiative and priorities that Cambodia will put out, you know, as part of its uh, chairmanship of ASEAN next year. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, being specific 
on a particular issue, issues. but how, you know, yeah. I would, you know, uh, approach these questions with a more broad perspective. Yeah. Uh, in my view, there are six issues that we may want to look at. The first one, it's never enough, you know, we just need to uh, do more, which is strengthening the cooperations. All of the problems that we face require multilateral responses. We have a numbers of key documents. The next step for us is to work together to address them, to implement them. So I hope that we uh, can uh, double down on this, uh, do more to uh, further strengthen uh, the uh, cooperation, inject more energies into our platform uh, so that uh, ASEAN member state and also partner can work together for the common good, hands in hand, right? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, uh, try to achieve uh, positive progress on some of those key initiatives and so on. The second area is the management of the COVID-19. It's going to be still a major problem next year or even the year following. So we have the framework, we have, soon we are going to have the ASEAN uh, Center for uh, Public Health Emergency and Emerging Diseases. Uh, we are going to have, you know, a stronger and more comprehensive framework that will allow the ASEAN member state to respond to COVID-19 and so on. So under uh, a, a Cambodia a chairmanship next year, you know, is for Cambodia to further, you know, strengthen that, making sure that all countries can work together to uh, tackle the problems of uh, COVID-19 procuring the vaccines together, strengthening the manufacturing base in the region, ensuring we have enough PPE, the sharing of data among the ASEAN member states will be effective, the surveillance system is strong so that we can detect the outbreak early, the capacity building for all the people who are part of these responses. You know, it sounds like I'm a doctor now, uh, but this, that, that is the prescription of some of the activities we need to do. Um, the third point here is to recover from this uh, COVID-19 economically. We have the ASEAN recovery framework, uh, a number of key initiatives, for example, to allow our people to travel, uh, like the ASEAN uh, travel corridor. Uh, we also uh, discuss on how we can uh, further strengthen, you know, intra-ASEAN trade and so on. We are also talking about, you know, uh, building resilience into our supply chain, uh, we are also talking about working together to reinvigorate our manufacturing sectors. Uh, all of those things uh, need to be uh, further uh, strengthened under Cambodia chairmanship next year. Uh, because at the end of the day, you want to contain the COVID-19, but you need to also make sure that uh, doing so will not affect the life and livelihood of our people as well. And by you know, letting our economy to grow again, our people can have jobs and so on. And that would be you know, a big relief for them in terms of how they are going to cope with this crisis in the long term. Um, now, it leads me to the uh, third uh, area here. It's uh, about the uh, Myanmar uh, issues. And uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of expectations, but what I can say is, is that you know, people, need, people need to also keep the expectation check. Yeah, uh, it's not an easy uh, issues. It's not some things that people can, you know, uh, resolve in one day. And the issues of Myanmar is also uh, addressed, you know, at multiple level, at the global level uh, as well. And uh, uh, as of now, I think there's still uh, some things we need to continue to do more. As for Cambodia, I think we have uh, a lot of experiences in, you know, uh, national reconciliations and all that. And I hope that this will be useful uh, in terms of sharing with our colleague in Myanmar. And uh, of course, you know, I believe Cambodia will try uh, its best to create uh, an enabling environment or a various platform for the different stakeholders to come together and, and find some compromises. Uh, at the very least, you know, to uh, 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 end the uh, violence uh, because, you know, uh, because of the COVID-19 and so on, the lives of the people is yeah. uh, affected severely already and with violence and war and all that, it just adds to the pain. So I, 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 I think those are some of the key uh, areas that we want to make progress, you know, uh, uh, bridging the gaps, sharing experience, creating an enabling environment, uh, introducing various platforms for different stakeholders to come to talk together and assess the uh, violence on the ground so people can uh, cope with the COVID-19 uh, and so on. 
uh, when it comes to the uh, and then the fourth point, which is the uh, major power competition, um, if, perhaps you saw you know the uh, press release you know uh, conversation with our deputy prime minister Prasakon and the foreign minister of Australia. Uh, I think that is the sentiment. You know, uh, uh, we we hope all of the new mechanisms that have been established by our partner will complement our own. Uh, you know, regional uh, structures and platform. We don't want to see competitions there. Yes. So what we what we are going to do is, you know, to continue to advocate uh, among our partners that, you know, what you do, you have to also think about the uh, interests of ASEAN and ASEAN member state and making sure that all of the new mechanisms that you are trying to put in place will complement, supplement the works that ASEAN is doing uh, as well. Anything that is not in line with those two thinking, uh, ASEAN find it very difficult to uh, support or accept. So, uh, and, and, and also, you know, provide, provide numbers of platform for all of the major power to sit down, uh, you know, uh, reconcile their differences, or at least, you know, promote cooperations in areas that they have common interests and so on. Now comes to my last point, the uh, sixth point, uh, which is, you know, the uh, possibilities that we can go beyond some of the immediate uh, or short-term kind of priorities. Many of the things that I talk, talk about are having this short-term uh, nature. So uh, Cambodia may also want to uh, put in place some long-term, uh, you know, uh, a project or initiative some things that will continue to shape the regions in the next 50 or, or 100 years. Uh, for example, on the issues of climate change, why not, you know, ASEAN Green Deal, you know, and the, and, 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 and the Cambodia uh, chairmanship and, 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 and so on. Um, one thing that I would like to also highlight, you know, as a, as, as a way to close it, uh, you know, being, an, being a, 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 a chair or a member of ASEAN, uh, all countries uh, aspire to, uh, you know, uh, put in place regions that will lead the countries in many years to come, or priorities that will shape the directions of the regions in many more years to come. It doesn't matter, you know, how big, how resourceful you are. As a member of the community, it's a responsibility. You have Brunei with a population of less than a million, but it also try to you know put in place the numbers of mechanisms that we have, you know long term implications in terms of chartering the direction of the uh, community building process and so on. So I think that is some things that we should also uh, uh, look at, and I would encourage all the people, you know, uh, especially our young people here in Cambodia, to support you know the uh, chairmanship as much as possible, uh, not just through the activities or platforms that are created by the uh, sectors uh, of uh, Cambodia as part of the chairmanship year, but also uh, activities and programs that are initiated by the ASEAN member state uh, next year uh, as well. And importantly, to also learn and appreciate about our diversities, our uniqueness, the people, tradition, culture, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, the ASEAN project, uh, successful or not, it depends on whether such a project we have the people standing behind it or not. And to have people standing behind it or not, unless they know why it matters to do so and how they are going to benefit from it. So with this, you know, I conclude this uh, question. <laughs> Excellency, this is a very splendid conversations I ever had and I was about to, to, to ask you to offer a very short message to our youth but you already did <laughs> you already did so uh, maybe you, you don't need but if you have more I think it would be great if you you want to send out a, a, a short message to not just only Cambodian Jews but all Jews across the regions if you wish please well um, very short one um, Strengthen your capacity capability. Offer your views and solution every opportunity you have. 
try your ideas as much as possible and contributing as much as as much as possible you know to the uh, solutions of the uh, major problems that we are facing the things that you are too junior to do it too small to do it you are the future there's a lot of expectations on you it's just that you need to make sure that you live up to those expectations Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, His Excellency. I hope that uh, we will have uh, a, the series of discussions regarding your works as well as uh, the regional projects that we haven't been uh, deep, deep into. For example, like the climate uh, issue, uh, the plan of the three uh, projects, like 10, 10 million or billion and so on. So we're looking at that throughout the process as well as the other initiatives. So I hope to have you as our guest speaker in the near future. Uh, His Excellency, thank you so much for your times and your contribution to this forum. You're most welcome. <laughs>